sounds fine with me. If everyone's done, then let's head out. Also, I drew these little bells that are like the change scene divider thing. They're cute. I did that for my latest book, Grey March, but it's crosses. Three little crosses. Okay. Fill up and Gemma. Fill up Gemma. I can walk through the door up to the tower. The tower was large, mostly occupied by a big golden bell, and the floor was made of a bluish tiled stone. Light wind breezed through the tower, making the bell sway gently. There was no rail on the edge. Gemma gazed up at the spiderweb laden wooden rafters. Wow, this is cool. How old do you think this tower is? Kian asked. Old, Philip answered, gingerly stepping towards the edge. Philip grabbed one of the support poles with one arm and stood on the very edge. Gemma turned around, seeing Philip. Oh my gosh, Philip, please don't stand that close to the edge. You're making me very nervous. I know what I'm doing. You freak out too much. He calmly leaned forward a little. Kian muttered famous last words. Philip narrowed his eyes at Kian. I heard that. You were supposed to, Kian said in a mocking tone. Gemma crept over to Kian, looking off the edge. Wow, you can see everything from up here. She grabbed Philip's arm. Though it makes me a little dizzy. From the tower, they could see all the way to the road. The cars were hidden behind a wall of trees. They could see the big garden and the huge glass greenhouse. The glass sparkling in the warm morning sun. The woods beyond the property stretched farther than their eyes could see. Kian peered off the edge. Your grandfather fell off of this. Yeah, Philip said. Kian whistled. Wow. Long way down. Kian, Gemma scolded. What? I was just saying. Gemma shook her head. Kian retreated to the opposite edge and looked out at the smaller garden. Philip gazed off at the road, lost in thought. Try to ignore my cousin. He's kind of insensitive. And a moron, Gemma said. You know, my brother thought it was a good idea to come back here. I thought it'd be fun, too, at the time. But now that we're here, is it because your grandfather died here? Well, my grandmother passed away here, too. Nothing as tragic as my grandpa, but still. Gemma put her hand on Philip's back. My parents drove up here to sort out some things after my grandma died. On their way back, a tree fell in their car right there on that road. Killed both of them. Philip paused for a second inside. Seems this place is surrounded by so much death. Sorrow passed over his face as he remembered. Having both his parents die at the same time had been mortifying, especially at such a young age. It had significantly impacted his mental health. It felt like a part of him had died that day, too. Like there was a bottomless hole in him that nothing could ever fill. There had been a very dark time in his life where he was positive he couldn't possibly go on. If it hadn't been for his caring and patient brother, Philip, he may not have made it through. Gemma grimaced. Why haven't you ever told me that before? I mean, I knew they died in a car crash, but I didn't know it was here. I don't know. I guess I just don't like to think about it or talk about it. Oh. Gemma pointed up to the garden, trying to change the subject and cheer her friend up. Look, there are the others down there by the fountain. Why don't we go join them? Philip nodded. Yeah, let's get down from here. The other six had just begun their walk in the garden when they came to a magnificent fountain. The fountain was eight feet tall, and gurgling water shot straight in the air out of spouts on all sides, cascading back down and splashing into the fountain's pool. A gorgeous mermaid statue lounging on a shell on top of the fountain. Intricate shells, shells were carved into the smooth marble sides all around. Mariana stood beside Pedro, admiring the fountain. It's so pretty. Mariana stuck her hand into one of the streams of water, making water spray out of Pedro and herself. Pedro took a step back and held out his hands, attempting to shield himself from the droplets of cold water. Hey, Mariana. Mariana and the others.
others laughed. They continued up the path into a small wooded area of the garden, the trees a green roof above them. It was dim and much cooler underneath the trees. Grass grew tall and thick off the path in the woods. White puffball mushrooms sat by the trunk trunks of trees, and different kinds of wildflowers sprung up in the grass. As they strolled, Ethan shared fun facts about literally everything he's on. Th those flowers right there are blue bonnets. Did you know that the botanical name for blue bonnets, lupinus, comes from the Latin word for wolf? I don't know if you pronounce it lupinus, but that's what I'm saying. Patrick walked beside Ethan. No, I didn't. That's very interesting. Patrick said, giving a look of exasperation at Franklin. Ethan continued, Those are puffball mushrooms over there by that tree. Puffballs grow on dead organic matter and are the only mushrooms to fully contain spores inside them. They are also edible. Don't eat mushrooms, by the way. <laughs> some puffball mushrooms are edible and some are not. You have to be really careful. And I wouldn't suggest eating wild mushrooms. Just as like a little disclaimer. Don't try to eat wild mushrooms unless you really know what you're doing. Connor leaned over and whispered in Franklin's ear. Does he ever shut up? Franklin chuckled a little. <laughs> they came to a wide creek with a sturdy bridge stretching across it. The creek was deep and calm. The soft trickle of water was very soothing. A stream of light shone down from a gap in the trees. Isn't this such a beautiful spot, Pedro said. Mariana leaned her head on his shoulder. Yeah. Pedro kissed the top of her head. They spent a few minutes longer at the bridge, enjoying the beauty of it, and then decided to continue down the path. The path came out of the woods and connected to another one, which led straight to the large greenhouse. In the greenhouse, they walked the cobble path of the many different varieties of colorful plants. They heard the chirps of the birds that had made themselves at home in the trees above them. They talked as they strolled along. So, Connor, Pedro said, how's detective life treating you? Connor replied, it's good. I mean, nothing's changed. Just chasing crooks and putting them on bars. Emily hates me going out every day and putting myself in danger. She wants me to get a different job, but hey, someone has to do it. Speaking of Emily, Franklin said with a sly smile, when are you two getting married? Connor looked at Franklin, when are you going to stop asking me that? When you propose, Franklin replied, still smiling. Connor changed the subject. Speaking of, have you two set a date yet? He said to Pedro and Mariana. Pedro put his arm around her. Yes, we have, Mariana answered. The wedding is next March. The 14th, Pedro's best friend. That's great. Am I invited? Connor said. Mariana laughed. Of course you're invited. You too, Frank and Patrick. Franklin grinned. Mariana and Pedro had been best friends since late high school and had begun dating two years ago. They had been engaged for only a few months, but they were already set on a beautiful spring wedding. Mariana and Connor's girlfriend, Emily, belonged to the same book club at their county library. They became fast friends because they both had a passion for writing, and of course, they introduced their men to each other, and they had formed a friendship, to friendship also. Have you thought about where you're having the reception, Patrick asked, because I know the perfect place. It's called Arcadio Hall. It's a fancy Italian ballroom and dining room used for big celebrations. A friend of mine had his wedding reception there. It's a really beautiful place. The name sounds familiar. Where's it at? Mariana slid the mint green scrunchie off her arm and then pulled her hair back into a low ponytail. You turn right the stop sign on Mission Boulevard, and just go straight, and you should see it eventually off to the left. Oh, okay. I take Mission all the time to get to work. Funny that it's right there, and I never knew about it. Yeah, you should definitely check it out, though. We will, for sure. She smiled gratefully. Pedro commented, we haven't really 
done much planning on the actual wedding so far. We're not really sure what our budget is for it yet. Mariana's parents offered to pay for the wedding. Wow, really? Connor said. Yep, my parents are the sweetest. Mariana leaned on her fiancé's shoulder. My dad's a lawyer. A dang good one, too. They've got plenty of money to spare. So I don't think we'll have to worry too much about the budget. Right, honey? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, Pedro, you worry too much. I'll call them once we get back and talk about it if you'd like. He smiled and kissed her on the cheek. Thanks, that would put my mind at ease. Franklin twiddled with a pink flower he had picked. Where are you guys honeymooning at? Leavenworth, Washington State, Pedro answered. Mariana added, it's just beautiful in the springtime, all the trees and their leaves and the flowers coming out. Sounds nice. Natasha and I went to Germany for our honeymoon. Franklin cast aside the flower and it fluttered to the stony path. We got married in the winter so we could go skiing in the mountains. The memory brought a smile to his face and a dreamy twinkle to his brown eyes. The perfect picture of white, glistening slopes surrounded by evergreen forest had been unforgettably breathtaking. The rustic log cabin nestled in the crisp snow by the by a frozen solid lake where they went ice skating. Him and Natasha snuggled up on the sofa in front of a roaring orange fire after a fun but exhausting day of skiing or skating. He was sure that their initials were still carved in the wood by the door exactly how they had left it. Franklin made a mental note to take Natasha back there someday soon. He wished she could have come along with them to the gardens, but she had to visit her uncle who was sick with cancer. Uh, Germany, Patrick sighed. I've always wanted to go there. Maybe I will someday. It's not a cheap trip, you know, Franklin said. Yeah, I know, but hopefully I'll be able to save up and me and Philip can go. Maybe I'll be able to get my art going and make money that way. Connor brushed a straight green leaf off his shoulder. You realize that most artists don't make any money or become famous until they're dead, right? Yeah, well, I was hoping to get enough money to go to Germany before I die. Can't exactly use the money I get after I die because, you know, I'll be dead. Technically, if someone wanted to, they could use the money from your paintings after you died to send your body to Germany. You could be buried there and fulfill your wish. Franklin grinned, his eyes shining the way they did whenever he was being sarcastic. Oh yeah, sure, let's ship my decomposing body to Germany. I'll be sure to put it in my will, Frank. Patrick rolled his eyes. They all laughed. Ethan lagged behind, engrossed by all the fascinating plants. As he bent over to examine a lilac, he thought he spotted movement out of the corner of his eye. He looked down the path, but there was nothing there. Shrugging, he walked a little ways, then heard something moving in the bushes. He stopped and whirled around again. The movement stopped. Ethan slowly started stepping backwards as the wrestling and the bushes continued. Something was following him. He backed up against the hedge, frantically glancing all around. A cold pair of hands emerged from the bush and grabbed at the neck at his neck from behind. He then screamed and scurried away from the bush. Philip pushed his way out of the bush, laughing uncontrollably. Gemma and Kean came around the edge of the hedge, also laughing. Realizing it was just a joke, Ethan joined them in laughter. You should have seen your face, Gemma hooted. Dude, that was priceless, Kean said, high-fiving Philip. All right, guys, you got me good. Ethan wiped his glasses on his shirt. The others hurried back down the path after hearing Ethan scream. What's going on? Are you guys okay? Pedro, Pedro asked. Philip answered with a huge smile on his face. Yeah, we're fine. Ethan just almost got eaten by a bush, that's all. All the kids burst out laughing, and the adults looked at each other, genuinely confused. Later, after the sun had sunk below the tree line and the late night shadows, and night shadows, I don't know what's wrong with me right now. Later, after the sun had sunk below the tree line and 
night shadows covered the land. They all sat in the er sitting area talking. Franklin stood in front of one of the windows, gazing out. Ominous, angry clouds had gathered in the late afternoon, and now they blanketed the sky completely. Thunder rumbled in the distance. Storm's coming, Franklin said. Patrick strode over and joined him at the window. Hopefully it will pass us by and be gone in the morning. Yeah, about the morning, Pedro said. We're here for another day and then we'll leave the next morning. We've seen the gardens already. I was expecting people to be here to give us a tour and tell us about the history of the place. Pedro looked around at the others. The question is, since there's nobody here and we've seen practically everything, do you want to leave early? It is weird that no one is here. I mean, someone was here. They just aren't anymore. Mariana thought out loud. Yeah, a guy answered the phone, Pedro said. They were all quiet for a second, the only sound being the rhythmic ticking of the clock that hung above the fireplace. Thunder boomed much closer than before. Philip spoke up. I don't think we should leave early. People are no people. This is our vacation. We should stay the whole time we intended. I agree, Patrick said. So that's two. What about everyone else? Pedro asked. Everyone settled that it was good, a good idea to stay. All right, as long as we're all in agreement, we'll stay. Mariana sat on the arm of Pedro's comfy chair. You'll be glad that we stayed. I'm sure we'll find something fun to do tomorrow. Pedro smiled and put his hand on hers. He and yawned. Well, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm dead tired. I'm going to bed. Since there's nothing else to do, it's probably a good idea that we all go to bed, Connor said. They all decided to head off to bed, saying their goodnights to each other before retiring to their rooms. And that is the end of chapter two. This is chapter three. I'm not going to read it today because my voice is tired. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.